we're going to transition into a conversation between Sunil and Renee Green, who is the organizer of Contact, which is the exhibition that is up at MOCA right now as a part of the Front Triennial and will be through the end of the year. Um, and so I'm just going to read introductions for them and then we'll set up a table and begin the, their talk. So Sunil Sands. Sansgari is an artist, researcher, and filmmaker. His work spans experimental video and film, animations, essays, installations, and contends with questions of identity, heritage, culture, and diaspora in relation to structural violence. And Renee Green is also an artist, filmmaker, writer, and professor. Um, via films, essays, uh, installations, digital media, architecture, sound-related works, film series, and events. Her work engages with investigations into circuits of relation and exchange over time, the gaps and shifts, and what survives in public and private memories, as well as what has been imagined and invented. She also focuses on the effects of a changing transcultural sphere, sphere uh, on what can now be made and thought. I should also mention that that last film, Golden Jubilee, is playing at the um, Museum of Contemporary Art in Cleveland here. Um, it's playing on a loop on this kind of um, drywall, piece of drywall that's leaning against the museum walls. It, it's really, it's kind of an amazing space to have the film playing in and it's on the floor. So there's scenes where like you can feel the, f you know, kind of where the scenes that are, the camera's lower to the ground. It really feels like, you know, people are reaching into the ground of the museum, the floor of the museum. I was stalling. <laughs> thank you, Renee, for being here. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, this is this was an amazing opportunity to see these works and to also um, have the opportunity to think about um, yeah the, the the all the works that are uh, on exhibit in Mocha Cleveland as well as um, the works that you've programmed throughout that we've programmed throughout the um, the series the contact series. Um, but maybe, uh, more would you like to start? What, how do we want to start? Um, good evening. <laughs> um, I can start that way. Hi, Neil. <laughs> See Neil. Um, I just wanted to say uh, a couple of things. I, I missed part of the introduction. Um, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> um, it's, it's very interesting to I mean, we've been talking about this for a while, um, about the whole, the series. I just wanted to mention something about, and talk with you about how series also can function uh, in relation to an exhibition. Um, because one of the things that I was interested in um, was expanding and also deepening what might be possible in relation to an exhibition. And so contact, um, in this instance, um, to just think, sort of focus on what contact can actually mean. Uh, and uh, each of the participants I invited uh, to, to engage uh, has been involved with thinking about some form of contact. And, um, and that's been really interesting for me to observe and also just to, to experience what might come about by putting all of these different things together. And so um, in this case with um, the series we talked about, uh, and I also have been really um, excited to experience um, some of the, the films that you suggested, um, the short films for that special series and I like to think about all of these different selections in conjunction uh, or in some form of relation. And so it helps me. Um, I did a kind of immersive dive uh, into uh, the films that you had su suggested within the past 24 hours. And I like to do that kind of immersive, immersive <laughs> um, viewing. Uh, and then to also watch all of your films again, the three that we've just seen, trilogy, uh, and think about those things together. And I was wondering if you could um, say something about some of your um, selections and also whether the trilogy has a title. Um, I was curious about that. I have many questions actually <laughs> that have to do with um, thinking about 
how you came to the trilogy to start with. But, and so you can choose any point that you might want. <laughs> I'm curious. Um, yeah, I mean, to think about when Renee in, you know, invited me to also co-program a series with her, which screened on Tuesday a selection of short films by artists that I'm also in contact with and dialogue, there's something that um, is becomes very apparent when um, you start thinking about the works that are not only uh, on view at Cleveland, uh, Cleveland, but also in the film series, is that there's this idea of like iteration, something that also comes up in your work and like the iterative gesture of having things that um, become in relationship to each other and affect each other and take on new meanings in relationship and proximity to each other. So this idea of contact, I mean, it's so integral to montage, right? Um, two things that perhaps are di disparate, that might not have a relationship to each other, suddenly take on a relationship to each other. So that's always fundamentally like what I go back to whenever I'm working on my own stuff. But also I think about it in terms of, um, you know, also this kind of durational uh, aspect of having a, you know, a monthly or weekly film series where perhaps you have some people who might have been at one of the screenings and then comes back and like what happens in between that time period, right? So I'm interested in like that that time period that comes in between watching a film in a film series where you know the film that preceded it and then it informs that your next viewing experience. So that's all to say that this um, there's, there's so much to unpack within this iterative kind of um, structure of contact um so but to answer your question so the the trilogy does have a title um it's a title that i thought about later and it wasn't until i finished golden jubilee that i wanted to um i was i was deciding i was questioning like does it need a title do i want to title it and so i, I landed on the title barober jactana which in konkani means um you know kind of like living living and surviving like it kind of me it it um evokes this idea of continuation um, and so it's just this idea of like living and surviving um, Barobar Jagtana. So the trilogy is called Barobar Jagtana which also um, gets referenced in the film Golden Jubilee and so I, I think about that um, just in this continuation also thinking about this idea of an iterative structure. Um, I also think about that in relationship to the feature film that I'm working on and how the three films that I have just made are then propelling the feature into the space where really it's continuing a lot of the work that the three films are doing. And so it's a ongoing process. It's not, it's not going to end <laughs> in many ways. There's not, there's not an end to it. There's no telos, I guess, in that sense. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the trilogy does have a title and it kind of started in 2019 um, almost by chance it was the first image that you see in the first film at home but not at home of these kind of 360 panoramic views of the um it, of goa um these kind of you know uh really distorted um meshed uh kind of collaged bodies and and you know vehicles and and the soil and the sky and the way in which the camera is unable to kind of make sense of itself by turning in by, by the camera trying to look at itself and the inability of the camera to look at itself. Um, that was the first image that I had encountered that I knew that I wanted to work with, but I had encountered that image in 2018 and it wasn't until a year later that I was like, okay, this, whatever I do, whatever ends up happening, I know that this has to be the first image. And I worked from there. So there was like this really like kind of immediate encounter with something that was a very, vis I had a very visceral reaction to. And it wasn't even an image I took. It was an image that I, you know, kind of happened upon. And um, that in com combination with the Stuart Hall interview that um, is on top of that is. Yeah, I mean, I find it really interesting um, seeing these three together. But I have to say um, for myself that I, ha I go back further in terms of thinking about your work. Uh, and so, and I can't help that um, because you were my students. <laughs> I did have to, yeah. I mean, and, and so, I mean, I, I love it. I love, <laughs> I love the whole way things are ongoing. 
and becoming. <laughs> and um, another another word that came up in this afternoon's uh, this conversation. Um, and so I cannot help but also think about your whole trajectory. Uh, and I find it very um, just I'm I'm so encouraged by that by what it is that you you've done uh, when you describe montage I think about all kinds of different attempts and efforts and arrangements um, made sometimes uh, in space uh, and you do have a work in space in in the museum uh, but also like how different kinds of ideas were arrived upon. Uh, and particularly, I'm interested in, I mean, it's, it's so, you've, you've really, I think you've really distilled a lot in these three films. Uh, and so, I guess, for me, I've, I've seen a lot of different things along the way, and I'm curious about how you came to focusing on your father, uh, because it's something that, it was under discussion at one point, um, and I, I mean, you did do this other previous work that was in Mexico, <laughs> and, and so there was a kind of, from my perspective, sort of circling around and, and searching, uh, and it was as if you found some uh, channel uh, in particular that related to um, history and your father and this intersection uh, and and also you uh, and so the year 1989 comes up and then is that you and that are you the baby in that photo yes. <laughs> anyway um, and so 1989 is also a really interesting turning point um, and so one of the what there are a number of things that strike me when I when I've experienced these films and of course, in, for me, anyway, the voice of Stuart Hall uh, is something that grabs me. And that's what is in the voice that we hear uh, in the first film uh, from 2019. And um, I, just, I was just wondering if you could say something about this, because also the way that you work with sound and the voices and all of that overlap is really interesting, and it references other kinds of um, moments. Um, and so your father is almost in this kind of, I don't know, Stuart Hall. I mean, he kind of sort of he gets meshed in a way. Uh, and I wonder if you could say something. Yeah, it's so, it's always interesting who notices Stuart Hall's very distinctive voice. Like he has a voice where you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's Stuart Hall. Um, for certain people, right? Like a lot of people encounter Stuart Hall through text, but don't encounter the other Stuart Hall, which is this extremely, uh, you know, like lyrical quality to his voice. This this incredible, like, um, kind of uh, timber to his voice that is very distinctive, especially for those who perhaps grew up with watching his television programs, things like that. Uh, but not everyone did, right? And so it's interesting to see who picks up on the Stuart Hall versus people who just kind of think that it's my father speaking. Because there's that there's a there's a trans there's no transition in between the Stuart Hall interview and when you hear my father's voice. And there's a kind of you know I mean it's it's just the the they happen to have similar you know and there you could probably look at the various kind of historical uh, ways in which accents develop. But, you know, there is a in really interesting quality to them. It was not something I immediately thought of. It was not something I was like, oh, Stuart Hall's voice sounds like my father's voice to some degree, maybe for some people. Uh, but it kind of, I've noticed that a lot of people don't make that distinction between that. And I find it interesting. Um, while it wasn't necessarily... Uh, you know, intentional. It's something that developed out of, you know, listening to audiences and hearing from people. Uh, but it was to say that, like, when I was working with this film, and while I'm editing, and when I'm working and kind of composing a film, it's very much like, um, you know, you work on it in pieces, but you grab certain elements of different references that, you know, perhaps you're reading or thinking about. It could even be um, something that's like in my library that I just happen to see on my table or something, you know, and I'm like, oh, what would that, what would happen if I kind of 
plugged this into the work and, and like what new combinations would. So I had found my way into listening to this Stuart Hall interview um, and I found an audio cup copy of the interview, which was amazing. And I there was just these certain passages that really distilled, once again, these ideas that I was thinking about, about, um, first of all, this this really important idea of um, this moment that he says at the beginning, he says, history is full of what what was never realized. And I think, you know, and, and I, I constantly return to that idea of uh, this idea of like, what does it mean to realize history? What is 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 history ever fully realized? Um, and I don't think. I don't think Stuart Hall would ever say that it is, but it's something that, um, you know, it's this idea that, uh, you know, one of the tragedies, one of the tragedies of colonialism um, is that we'll never know what could have blossomed in its place. We don't know what kind of worlds could have existed, um, but that there's always this imaginative capacity to think uh, through time, right? And think of occurrences and think of points of connection that then contributed to the world in which we're in now, uh, which is why I think about 1989 constantly <laughs> as this year that I entered into the world, uh, that I happened to enter into the world, uh, but at the same time had like massive consequences in terms of everything else that was going on at that one given point in time. And one thing that I always love about your work and that I learned from your work is um, being able to gesture to so much just through um, hinting at a period and then all of the associations that one might get from that and each person has a different association with a date or a time or a name um and that you allow the audiences to really invest themselves and 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 extract or extrapolate kind of meaning uh from just positioning a time or a name uh and potentially in combination with each other um yeah i mean no that's it's all very interesting um in 1989 in particular um thinking about uh the idea for example of culture in the age of three worlds um it's the name of a title of a book by My michael denning um who uh I, you can sort of think about in relationship to Stuart hall um it it really strikes me, though, I mean, in terms of the constellation of different um, participants and the kinds of work in the exhibition also, um, the relationship, say, of John Acumfra, uh to I mean, Stuart Hall. Stuart Hall Project was a film that was made in 2013, um, and it's one in which we are able to experience the way the media uh, has, um, well, snippets that were combined to make a voice. And so I'm mentioning it in part uh, because the void uh, is an aspect, that's what Stuart Hall says in the beginning in the quote you use, the void. Uh, and so I, that I wanted to focus on the void <laughs> in the sense that what you're working with in these different films is... Um, imagining what else could have happened. And so your means by which you're doing it, uh, I, I was wondering if you could talk about that a bit because I think it's very interesting, the combination that you've decided to use of um, the 16 millimeter uh, of way of shooting. Um, I've got questions about that. Um, as combined with animation, combined with um, the desktop that desktop aesthetic uh, that you've been developing, uh, and so this kind of way of the montage, how that how that even is functioning, is something that is um, there are different kinds of layerings that are going on, there are different sorts of um, combinations that you're using, and you're also enacting something. Um, that's not, that hasn't actually, you don't know exactly how it would have taken place, but you're sort of creating a way for us to see it. Uh, and so that's something that I was curious about, how you came to that. Yeah, um, especially going back to that idea of the void, I mean, it kind of is, it becomes apparent in 
many ways throughout the films, and I'm glad you picked up on that. One of the ways I think about it is in relationship to Golden Jubilee, where we used the I, I was using the LIDAR scanning and the photogrammetry techniques to scan um, uh, my father's ancestral home. It's also my ancestral home. It's something that's that's always been one of the moving aspects of it is my uh, family in Goa, you know, they're like, this is your house, too. Like, no one owns this house. This is a, the sans Gary house. So this is your house, too. When did I... It was during the filming. They were like, oh, this is your house. Like, this is... That's what an ancestral house is. It's not... I had been there before. Yeah. I So I went in 2020 was the first time. And so the first film it, in the email correspondence with the drone videographer I worked with, he... Um, you know, I, I very clearly state, like, I've never been to India. I've never seen my father's village. I've never visited, you know, this entire life. Um, once again, another kind of a void, right? In, in, a, in a kind of way. So, um, but I wanted to see how these different ways of seeing these different te techniques uh, and technologies would change my relationship to this question of uh, home, this question of um, identity, of diaspora, like what does it mean to belong to a people? Is it possible to, you know, find that kind of connection through cinema, through moving images, through, you know, desktop experiences, through, you know, um, other people's 360, you know, is it possible to develop that connection? through that? It was a question I had and I still don't know the answer to it. But this idea of the void, it carried over into the, um, the the technology, the LIDAR scanning and the photogrammetry, which it should be noted um, is also the same technologies that the mining companies use um, in the nearby region. So I was thinking about, you know, what it means to kind of reappropriate this technology that these mining companies use for extraction and surveillance to then be one of preservation with the ancestral home. Um, but what you get is these really uncanny kind of um, moments of crystallization of, you know, this 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 house. And and but there's so many moments in which the image breaks down, and you and the mesh. It's called like a mesh, right? And the mesh breaks down, um, and you just get these gaps. You get these like dark voids. And I'm very interested in that space. And I'm interested in the relationship to, you know, this these kinds of gaps in memory. The gaps in history, you know, the voids in history, the voids in memory, um, and and these kind of like, you know, back to what Stuart Hall was talking about, you know, this idea of diaspora being a void. It doesn't mean that it's not an irreparable void, that it can't be filled, as he says, but that it's just, you know, that it's just something that exists, that 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 is that is what it means to be in this space. Um, and it's I don't think he thinks of it as like a tragic thing or anything like that. He acknowledges the um the the great beauty that exists in that void um and the kind of weight that it holds and i, I think about it, that's my interpretation of it at least um and and i kind of like you know thinking about like ways in which visualizing whatever it is i'm trying to think about at that given moment thinking about um you know kind of non like where the image starts to break down um and i think about that in relationship to the materiality of 16 millimeter film too uh, the ways in which the film degrades, the ways in which the film and the image break down, um, and the ways in which you can have uh, very visceral experiences with uh, the 16 millimeter camera that are very different from other ways of experiencing uh, and filming. Yeah. So that combination is part of what you're you're seeking uh, to really go into because that's I mean that's part of what I find interesting in terms of the whole texture but and so then in terms of textures and probing these things and the viscerality what about the sound could you say something about the way that you use the sound? So I've been working with a composer. Well, it's funny because she was not a, actually a composer. She's a, a musician. Um, her name's Amirtha Kadambi, and she has a, a band called Elder Ones that kind of is this really amazing combination of like punk and free jazz and electronic. And um, she's a, a, she's a Tamil. She's a, her family's from Tamil Nadu, and the South. And um, it's um, we we kind of met through a mutual friend, um, and I I we you know we our our politics were very similar she's an organizer uh and an educator and so um it was kind of amazing because we the first thing we 
just got along with was our shared politics. And then we were trying to figure out like, oh, we should collaborate or something. I had never heard her music before, but um, it was very different. It was not necessarily music that I would find myself interested in, but I was very interested in this kind of relationship um, of being able to collaborate with this person. So uh, she had some of her friends and, and she kind of wrote some themes for the first film uh, home but not at home and and I I recorded the soundtrack like I you know I hooked up like seven or eight different microphones in a room and they just improvised and it was um, incredible uh, these you know they organized around a few themes she played the harmonium and did vocals and was directing everyone and there was an upright bass player and a saxophonist um, and they just improvised and it was just this incredible experience um, and so I used that for the first film the second film uh, I had I was going to actually do an original recording with her, but then I was just using kind of stuff that she already had, and it ended up working really well. I was just like, well, maybe I'll just use this. This is great. And she's like, yeah, you can use it. Um, and then the person who introduced us, whose name is Booker Stardrum, who's also kind of an experimental percussionist, um, he had some tracks that I was playing around with, and I was like, oh, this it's perfect. Let's just let's leave it in here. Then for the third film, Golden Jubilee, I actually asked them to collaborate. So they had never collaborated before, but my friend Booker was the one who introduced Amartha and I, and they were friends. And so I was like, what would that be like? Like, you know, what would that kind of combination be like? Um, and they didn't know either, which was pretty exciting. Um, so I, I kind of gave them a lot of um, descriptions of how I was thinking about the film and, and um things like that the film was not complete at that time I just had clips and glimpses of it so um, they composed a theme uh, Amirtha composed a Devkar theme that she actually now performs live um, in her kind of set list um, and so she composed a Devkar theme and then they kind of improvised with a, a, another saxophonist and a um, I can't remember some maybe a violinist but um, that uh, that combination for them, I mean, we were thinking about a lot of things. I was I was talking to her a lot about this idea of prana, like in in Hinduism, this idea of prana, which is you know this breath, the life force. Um, but it used to be that um, prana, uh, it was one, you know, time was measured in a very different way. Uh, you know, thousands of years ago, it was that one full breath was considered one moment but that moment would be equivalent to about like four seconds of our one second now so that full breath would take four seconds long and was considered one moment so i was thinking i was just really interested in this like, different experience of time just like my father and the clock right like he didn't have any clocks growing up um and he could only tell time by the sound of the train um, so this is completely different relationship to um, time that is not through um, industrialized time. Um, and I was thinking about that. And so we were talking about what instruments we could use to um, kind of achieve this kind of breathy voice and this kind of breathing. Like the film has this, um, a, the sound really has this breathing kind of quality through the instruments and this um, scratchiness. So, we, you know, those were some of the things that we talked about in terms of the composition. No, that that really comes across, and also with the way that you have these other kinds of layers and a certain kind of scratchiness and texture that's kind of running through them as a sort of link. So the sound is really holding a lot of all of that um, movement. There are a number of questions. Um, I, I have questions. Your work has many questions, <laughs> continual questions, and open uh, open ended uh, aspects to it. I have one more. Th question and I think maybe I'd, I'd like to open it up uh, if that's okay uh, but um, I'm curious uh, you focused on the father what about the mother <laughs> that's a <laughs> it's a question I ask you know myself too because of work focusing on my father and also work with my mother but not I mean that's for example even in the exhibition but not there's not a physical um, iteration of my mother, uh, so I'm just wondering for yourself. Yeah. No, it's a really it's a really important question. It's something I think it's something I think about too, um, in relationship to just the time period in which they met, which was 1968. 
and so like once again a number a number another year another number another like time period of like you know immense you know my father came to the u.s in 1968 which is when he met my mother and so i'm thinking about that that time period because really it's like you know that was the time in which they fell in love right and i think about them together it's hard to kind of separate that relationship i grew up with my mother i did not grow up with my father so i think that there's a lot of this work is an attempt to get to know my father um you know my parents got divorced when i was very young i was like eight and so a lot of you know i did not grow up with my indian heritage whatsoever so a lot of this work as you mentioned kind of in you know my graduate studies when we were working together uh and was not working on this kind of history and this um these ideas I mean, I was working on similar ideas, but not necessarily this particular, um, you know, kind of heritage and lineage. So um, it's it's an it's something I'm still actively thinking about about that relationship of uh, my mother's biography and and living, you know, what lives she lived um, at that time and what drove her to, you know, like what were the conditions that both of them lived through in 1968 um in texas you know it's like such a specific um time you know time and place that um you know 1968 for them to to live through um together and for my father having just immigrated to the u.s only you know what uh four years after he was legally allowed to even come to the u.s because of the um the uh 1964 laws that were passed right indians were not allowed to um become citizens in the u.s until 1964 so only four years after um so i think a lot about that relationship of um you know what that would have been like for her you know um a white woman kind of uh you know striking up this romantic relationship with someone who um four years prior was not even allowed to really become a citizen in the u.s things like that. You know, it's just, it's interesting to think about those kinds of, um, those moments. Yeah. Oh, I, th I think so. I think so too. I think it also comes across through some of the series, um, some of the um, films that are included, including the Karima News film, for example, and um, even, well, Contact, <laughs> the film, <laughs> Contact. Um, that's right. <laughs> There's often a missing person <laughs> in these configurations. And so um, I'm not exactly sure how to do this. Does anyone have any questions uh, from the audience? Anything anybody would like to say? I can pass the mic to you. <laughs> <laughs> we have to we have to share it someone raise i don't want to pick it up thank you thank you neil um i wanted to ask about your relationship to animation specifically because I think it's really interesting um, your approach to a lot of the documentary material, your approach to music. I think on a lot of aspects you have a real um, kind of expertise. And what I really appreciate about animation is it kind of feels like, I mean this in a complimentary way, we're learning it with you. You, you don't seem afraid of like showing edges or cracks or these other um, kind of things. So could you just speak a little bit about your relationship to animation and also how it's changed because you've obviously like you're developing an expertise right you're getting you you are getting better so what is it that's drawing you now in terms of animation um yeah so the, the question about animation um i mean i think about it a lot in terms of you know the kind of the root uh of the term animation and what that means uh like etymologically uh like to to animate right to like to give life to something. Um, so I think about it a lot in terms of this question of, um, I guess you could call it world building, but I think about it in terms of like more like imaginative. So 
Stuart Hall once again uses that term imaginative, right? He taught, he says, uh, cinema for me was uh, a site of escape. It was an imaginative site or something like that. So he uses that word imaginative. And I, I really think about animation in relationship to that, um, especially the 3D rendered um, scenes, the scenes that don't necessarily, I mean, I guess they obey the laws of physics, but they're kind of in somewhat impossible situations where like you have this giant tap, you know, this giant, I don't know what it is, a piece of fabric that has an image of my father when he was about my age and it falls from the sky and then it catches the train as it's moving along, you know, like, yeah, I guess I could stage that and, you know, if I had a giant budget. Um, but animation, there's something about it that gives, I mean, it, it creates this very dreamlike quality to it, you know, and I think that um, once again, I think about just this idea of giving life to something and what that means. Um, and so a lot of the scenes also in specifically in Letter from Your Far Off Country, the second film, uh, all of the material that you see was transferred onto 16 millimeters. So there's this transfer um, where, you know, a lot of the, whether it's the desktop experience or the 3D animations that I make or like YouTube clips that I found, right? Those now are living on film, on a living material um, of celluloid. You know, they are now subject to the same conditions of decay that my body is and that the rest of us are. So there's this connection of like, you know, once again, giving life to something and, and then like also letting that material kind of die with time too to some degree um although one can make the argument that film will last a lot longer than like any digital image if it's if it's taken care of properly it'll outlive most digital images yeah yeah i'm interested if you could talk a little more about how these films come together and whether there's a particular element leading them um not so much conceptually, but, you know, sound, image, and also the text, which I'm noticing is kind of a, a pastiche or collage, but is also sort of threading a lot of things together. So I'm wondering um, if there's something that leads uh, the composition of a film or, um, yeah, I'm curious about that starting phase and kind of what is the thread. Um, kind of a follow-up question. Um, uh, so I noticed that there's a clear hierarchy of the text always being in the middle of the screen. And that is definitely unique for a documentary to have such a presence of the text and being very intentional about it. So yeah, I'm wondering why you thought of structuring it that way. And what do you think that language and semantics play in this context? Um, yeah, both really interesting questions. I think um, to answer the first question, um about uh i guess i guess you were kind of asking like what what's is there like an i i, I maybe it, were you asking kind of like the impetus for the work or was it more about like what what is the kind of like struct like what is the structural i'm thinking like i, I guess i was wondering when you start with do you start with images okay right yes okay okay what do i start with well for instance the First thing I started with in the first film was, like I said, that 360 image that I kind of found, um, stumbled upon. I don't want to say found because that I, I, I have been trying to avoid the term found footage um, because it has this like colonial connotation of like discovery and this idea of like that. Um, but uh, but so like something I perhaps, you know, kind of encountered and it was just this, um, uh, you know, this this kind of weird mesh of bodies huddled together with like the landscape and things. So it, it always kind of starts with, um, generally starts with, um, an image that I kind of, uh, encounter in one way or another. So for instance, the second film letter from a far off country, the images that I encountered were actually not even in the film. Um, the images that I encountered were of the student protests in 2019 against the CAA, which is the Citizenship Amendment Act, um, which effectively banned or barred Muslims from becoming citizens in India. And so I would, and I was in the U.S. at the time, and I was seeing this, you know, massive amount of horrendous uh, imagery of students being beaten at the Jamia Millia Islamia University where students were staging these protests against the CAA um, bills, the Citizenship Amendment Act. Um, and uh, and then some weeks later, 
um, a week before I arrived in India for the very first time, um, an entire Muslim neighborhood had been burned to the ground. Um, this was just a week before I had arrived. So I was seeing images and, and, and videos of these, you know, horrendous acts of violence committed against, specifically committed against Muslim people um, and communities in, in India. And none of those, of course, made their way into my film. I did not want to show them. There, There's a film called A Night of Knowing Nothing um, by pa Payal Kapagia that also takes an epistolary format. Um, that's actually one of the best things I've seen in a long, long time. Highly recommend that film. Her film also deals with the siege of Jamia, Jamia Millia Islamia University, and she shows the footage, um, something I purposefully chose not to do. Um, but that was actually the impetus for that film. And it was this really, this moment of reckoning of being like, um, you know, a reckoning with my own identity and, and heritage and, and wanting to embrace that and, and really dive deep into it, but also acknowledging the mass violence and, and the really sharp fascistic turn that India has taken um, and, and, and holding that contradiction, right? It's a question that gets act, asked very directly in the first film. How, how can one embrace anti, or how can one embrace anti-colonial heritage without embracing nationalism, right? Um, so that's kind of, that was the, that was the, uh, the kind of the images that sparked that second film, although I did not in, end up including them. And the third film, I think um, I knew that I wanted to um, do this kind of 3D rendering of this folk tale of the dev car, which is a folk tale that my cousin had told me, um, which was this wandering spirit that you could hear. Uh, you can't see it, but you can hear the cane rattling through the villages. So very much sound was um, a core element of it and supposedly would bring the workers back home if they were lost. Um, this was also happening during the farmers' protest in 2020, uh, 2020 and 2021, which still to this day is the largest protest in human history, which is really crazy to think about. So, you know, they're all kind of informed by these, um, by images that I see and encounter, mostly through like media apparatuses, um, and then kind of filter through my own understanding of uh, images, other images and history images that I take, images that I borrow, images that I. Um, work as co-conspirators with um, in that type of sense. And then to go to the second question about the, the text being in the middle, uh, yeah, it's something that um, as a, within the first film as a structural choice um, was really to um, prioritize what was being said and the kind of a textual element that was coming from my father just speaking as I was interviewing him and really kind of trying to play out this um, this, um, you know, the primacy of what was being said. And, and I prioritized it over the images, right? And there's literally like a drop shadow effect on all of the text so that it feels like it's actually distant from the images that you're seeing. So there's this actual distant, like it's kind of, you know, it's an illusion, but this distance that's created from the text and the image to separate them to some degree and to say, I'm prioritizing what's being said over what you're seeing, despite how visually enchanting the images some of the images are um, and it was just something that I continued throughout the rest of the films to varying degrees um, you know subtitles are something I'm actively thinking about the politics of subtitles you know who gets to be subtitled um, why that person would be subtitled over someone else um, you know there's there's lots there to think about in terms of subtitling yeah intertitles too yeah and those are really kind of both you know to kind of serve as my voice, uh, as the author's voice, but also um, hopefully uh, the audience's voice too. And so that the audiences read them in their own voice. And there's this kind of, um, because most of them are questions, it's me posing the question to the audience, but the audience being forced to read it in their own head and hear themselves think through the question themselves. Um, you know. That differs from a documentary. Yeah, I don't consider my work documentary at all. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think it's fine if someone thinks of it in that way. You know, people kind of think of like experimental documentary and things like that. Um, I, I, I try not, you know, people think of some of my films as desktop documentaries and all these things. And I, I just try to avoid all of that. I mean, you know, it's fine if people want to label certain things, but I'm not particularly interested in labeling my own practice right now like besides just being like their films you know and I'm an artist 
think the thinking process comes through all the different layers and everything. And so I think that we actually have come to the end of our time. Uh, and um, I thank you all uh, for joining. Uh, it's great to see an audience. Um, and thank you, Neil, Sunil, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah i hope i hope everybody gets a chance to see the rest of the films that are in the series and also visit the exhibition uh tomorrow actually there uh is an event taking place at one uh in the afternoon at moca uh and that is uh laura jennison and pedro silverstein are going to be uh discussing uh the work uh that they've been doing and you're welcome to join. Thank you. Thank you.